So let's get started. Um, first of June, Thursday. We're looking at the um, we're looking at Arthur Evans. Now um, I'm going to probably try and do a, a much more archaeology today than than usually, and then next week we'll be looking at um, the wonderful area of um, pottery kilns uh, through the ages, and then we'll be doing other type things like mills and so on, um, and lime kilns. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't got my pocket screen, um, and if we just tweak with that a little bit, there's Arthur Evans. That's as large as you're going to get. So I don't know how we're going to do this because I'm sort of in the middle. You can see you as well, Carl. You're famous. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm famous. There I am. <laughs> um, so that that's Arthur Evans, and Arthur Evans' contribution to archaeology um, is quite ranging, actually. But we will we will look at all the detail as it um, comes out. So we need to first look at um, some of the first work um, in Aylesford in Kent, uh, where he discovered um, a new type of pottery that hadn't really been um, uncovered or understood properly um, until the 1880s. Um, our individual Arthur Evans was born in 1851 and he died in 1941. He lived 90 years. It's quite strange. It? We, we get a number of archaeologists who did indeed live um, a long life. Um, he's most known for his excavations um, at the site of Knossos in Crete, um, a site itself that some people um, completely concur with me when I say that the excavations were done to a very high standard and the level of reconstruction cannot be faulted. And you get the other school of archaeologists that would say that the reconstructions were completely wrong and his archaeology, uh, his archaeological mythology uh, was faulted. But it's got to be said that um, when Arthur Evans uh, was leading his workforce, um, typical uh, Cretan uh, guys from the, the 1900s. He, he worked for um, over three decades at Knossos. Like many archaeologists before him, and like many archaeologists after, um, Andronicus at Vagina, when he was working on um, Prince Philip II's tomb, the whole family w would work there. You know, archaeologists, when they find a site uh, that is absolutely amazing, um, they seem to keep hold of it, um, very much like the Burleys with the site of Vindolanda. The whole generation is excavating at Vindolanda, they're finding more and more, and it's their archaeology. It's, it's their so so Knossos itself was was um, was very different from um, the likes of um, the discovery of Tutankhamun, where it sort of brought to the end of his career really. Um, when we look at uh, Howard Carter's excavations, but it was almost as if the, um, the story of Knossos, um, the different layers of, of interesting, um, intriguing um, aspects that we'll go on to. But this is basically the reconstruction at Knossos. Um, and it said that the site of Knossos was being um, reconstructed as the excavations were more or less being undertaken. And what, what, what we mean by that, I can really describe it, that uh, when I was um, excavating in Spain um, at a place called Santa Maria, there was a really wonderful um, conservator there, really, really talented, called uh, Miguel um, Angel. Um, and uh, when we were excavating at this site, um, we would excavate, and at the same time, after the excavations had been completed and it's all been planned and photographed and recorded, he would be reconstructing it. So that would mean that the archaeology itself um, would have um, a longevity um, in that it was preserved straight away. And the whole purpose of Arthur Evans um, with his reconstruction at um, Knossos was to give the site some longevity and hundred years on you can still see his work. But when you look at many other archaeological sites, um, I, I would even say like Killian, to be honest with you, you go to Killian today 
and there's brambles growing out the walls and it's all overgrown in parts and all the rest of it. The rest of it looks great, but it's not in a good state of preservation. That's because it's not really being cared for. Just forget about my criticism of Cadu, but um, when, when you excavate a site, you've, you've got to have a plan. Um, and I mentioned a site the other week called Hard Knot in Cumbria. And when they were excavating at Hard Knot and revealing the walls, they decided to um, protect the walls by um, building them a little bit more higher for indicating at which point where they had reconstructed. And you can clearly see where the reconstruction is at Knossos um, as opposed to the original. But how much of that is covering um, do you know what, Kathy? I'm not going to answer that question. The reason why is because it's not a question that um, it's not a question that um, would do as much good. Because um, the reason why it wouldn't, it's a question that wouldn't do as much good is it comes into the school of some archaeologists saying he got it completely right by reconstructing the archaeology up to this height when we took it down here. Um, another archaeologist saying it's completely wrong. So that's the answer. Um, but what you can see in the foreground, there is some. Um, excavated archaeology, um, and lots of this here, um, and some of the faces, is, is basically original, but that's not original. Um, that That's basically um, cast concrete, but it's still there. <coughs> On another, another side of the coin, um, at this time, the Italians were really um, upset with the fact that Arthur Evans had found this site um, in, in Crete and was excavating it. So the uh, uh, Italians excavated a site called Phaestos. We don't need to leave where what Phaestos is famous for. Um, as Arthur Evans is making the wonderful discoveries of Colossos, the Italians find the Phaestos disc. Basically, it's a competition in archaeology. You've ever seen the Indiana Jones film Rage of the Lost Ark? Who gets to the um, Ark first? That type of thing. Some people believe that the Italians faked the face off this, but one thing that they did do um, was when they were excavating um, on the island of Rhodes, those people have actually seen the Temple of Lindos and have been really disappointed. Um, if they'd have gone down beyond the 50 years ago, they would have seen most of the temple completely reconstructed by the Italians. Cast concrete, um, metal framework, iron framework, and what the Italians were doing, they would cast concrete, metal framework, bit of the original, cast concrete, metal framework. And over the years, as the sun was hitting it, water was getting in, um, yes, it does rain in roads. Um, what was happening is it was all reacting and, and it was all exploding as tourists were going past. It would heat up and go, <laughs> basically, um, the metal would expand so much it would go crack. And so they had to demolish, yeah. they had to take down the temple and rebuild it. Or, no, they didn't. They, they had to take down the temple, get rid of the co cast concrete and whatever, the metal work, and what you're left with is, is less of the archaeology than they started with. But that was, that's not the case. When we look at these wonderful ruins um, of Knossos that have been reconstructed, and if we should, Dad, tell him to play with the traffic. So, um, you can't really see this, um, and it's not really meant to see it, but... Um, Arthur Evans was very much into um, taking um, copious notes every single day. Uh, this one's dated um, April the 14th. Like, it doesn't say the year, so let's say 1901. Um, but excavation work continued there for nearly three decades. Most of the work was done between 1900 and 1905, but they're still excavating there today. Um, and he did copious notes, really proof-looking notes, but obviously... Uh, these all led to a wonderful publication um, and um, illustrating the wonderful finds. And this isn't meant to. This is not meant to be a lecture today about Knossos at all. But it's, it's one of his main pieces of work. Um, and there's the ballast. <coughs> what the hell was that? I don't think it should be filmed. Good. So it should. There's there's the there, there is the palace of Knossos. Okay. Now, um, there's lots, there's lots of little stories interwoven here, which, which we'll go on to. Um, but what we can see is, is this illustrates um, a reconstruction um, of what the palace of Knossos um, may have looked like. Now, we're looking at this palace existing. A few major points to make here. This palace existing um, 4,000 years ago, right? 
um, when we were still struggling to um, build build or complete Stonehenge, who was our <laughs> Um Where we're still living in roundhouses, you've got this. Where we're not writing, that's a bit of a risk. Where we're, where there's no evidence that we're writing, that's better. Um, they actually had written records, but they're still classed as prehistoric. They have the language and writing. They're still classed as prehistoric. They're civilized. They're still classed as prehistoric. The word prehistoric really means nothing now, because prehistory means before the written record. But they had they had writing. They had linear A, linear B. Um, they they had text. They, they 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 had a form of writing, whatever way you want to look at it. They had pictographic writing. Pictographic writing is for children. It's meaningless scribble that nobody can understand. You tell. One billion Chinese that, and I'm sure they would disagree. So pictographic writing um, is used by more people on this planet than English is used, okay? Um, and they used pictographic writing 4,000 years ago. Um, and I don't want to show you those dates because um, <coughs> dates are slightly different, but um, about 1,628 BC, as most of you know, Santorini blew its top theory up, and basically we lost the first stage of Minoan civilization. But it did continue. It did continue for a little while longer. Um, and what, I'm, what I've got the pleasure of doing today, as you can look at an image in the background, oh, you don't want to look at ex excavated remains. What you want to look at is, a, is another reconstruction with a bit of a thing there. There's another reconstruction there. Um, and the reason why I've got all these extra computers um, <coughs> is because I can read off the one and I can read it to the back of it. If I can read it. Um, so, um, Sir Arthur John Evans, Sir, um, born on the 8th of July 1851, um, died on the 11th of July 1941. You can imagine, I just want to make it past my 90th birthday. And he did by three, by three days, so that's great. Um, he he did have some stability. He had women in his life, but the women weren't really really massively um, figures in his archaeological work. But they are there. Okay, not a chauvinistic statement, um, but you know um, other individuals in archaeology are very important. When Schliemann, um, as a comparison, you look at um, Sophie, um, his um, <laughs> younger wife. Um, she was very much involved in the excavations as well. It all helps. He's classed as an English archaeologist. Of all, he's an English archaeologist. Um, and he's basically a pioneer in the taboo. And the taboo is saying that something existed in Greece before Greek civilization. That's taboo. That's like, phew. Um, in, in, in the 1800s, 1850s, nothing existed before ancient Greece. Nothing existed before. Nothing existed before Rome. When we look at Italy, but we've got the Etruscans. But the Romans did a good job of destroying Etruscan civilization. But the Greeks never did a job of destroying Minoan civilization or Mycenaean civilization. Let's not bowl us over with with uh, terms and civilizations here. But um, it, it's it's very likely um, that everybody believed that nothing occurred in Greece. Um, before 2,500 years ago, when in fact 1,500 years earlier was a massive civilization called the Minoans, which in fact Arthur Evans made his name from. Did I say discovered? I didn't. And there's a point there. He made his name from. He realized that the evidence of another archaeologist in 1878 revealed a new civilization. Nobody wanted to believe, for example, that there was anything that existed before ancient Greece. Nobody wanted to believe that at all. But he did, and there was somebody else who believed it as well. Um, the archaeologist, Dr. Heinrich Schliemann, had found the Mycenaean civilization when it comes to look at Troy, dating to 1,250 years BC. But then the Minoan civilization was a lot earlier, by 750 years. Massively early. But this was too early for Schliemann. He was not really interested in it. We know he visited Crete, but he was not interested in Knossos because it's probably a bit too early for him. 
But who was interested in it was Arthur Evans. Both Heinrich Lehmann and Arthur Evans believed in this concept that something had existed before ancient Greece. <coughs> After all, is that age-old question, what existed before Stonehenge? Um, what made Stonehenge as it is before? Where, where's the sort of trial and error sites? Um, archaeologists believe that Stonehenge is very unique. But what isn't unique is ancient Greece. There's too much of it to basically say it's an accident. It must have occurred from somewhere. Those, those um, Doric, Ionic, and then later on Corinthian columns into the Roman period must have developed from somewhere, must have developed from an earlier civilization. Um, and we start to see all this being peppered over the years. Um, we found um, he was not, when Sir Arthur Evans was working at Canossos, he sort of thought that he was looking at the My Mycenaean civilization. Um, but then maybe um, Schliemann said, actually, this is a bit earlier for me. And, and then the discoverer of this early civilization was, in fact, Arthur Evans, the Minoan civilization. That's controversial. Um, he's, he's said to have described this as the Minoan civilization. Um, but the archaeologist who first discovered the site was called Minos in 1878. Which is very strange, I know. Very strange, yes. That's something that I, I, I had to... I, 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 I missed it out when I was giving my lecture on Tuesday because I had to sort of um, rework it out. <laughs> but um, the archaeologist working on it was called Minos in 1878. Uh, but the information about the civilization with the sense of bulls and Greek mythology and King Minos, Theseus... Um, Persephone and all the rest of it. He said, right, it looks like a labyrinth after he's excavated it, so I've just gone straight for the guts. And therefore, it's linked to King Minos, therefore like, I'll, I'll call it the Minoan civilization. Um, but, bit, of, bit problematic there. Uh, but anyway, not a problem, but, but the, the fact of the matter is all that dross, forget this Carl talking, but um, he did discover a new civilization, whatever you call it. And he's one of very few archaeologists to actually call a civilization by a certain name. Nobody invented the Roman civilization, or the Egyptian civilization, or the Aztec civilization, or the Mayan civilization, or, or any of these um, pharaonic dynasties or anything. They, they were already there, we already knew the names, but he actually said, right, we'll call them the Minoan civilization. Okay? And it was based on something, um, rather than nothing at all. Evans was um, also the first to define... Crucian scripts, linear A, linear B, um, as well as an earlier pictographic writing. So he's able to say, actually, um, not only that I've got a civilization, they were writing. They, 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 they were literate. Not illiterate, literate. <coughs> and one thing I'm going to completely miss today is this. Um, in this, in this, across this five acre site, okay, because this is over five acres, over 1,000 rooms. Okay, um, on different tiers. Now, when they say 1,000 rooms, are they talking about one of the earliest levels or whatever? But over 1,000 rooms, uh, basement, ground, first, uh, second, third, fourth, whatever. Um, or different floors. Now, this, <coughs> this is beyond civilization, this is an extremely advanced. Um, and it ended because of the events um, that, that occurred when Thera erupted. Um, but that was going to happen anyway. Um, Roman civilization didn't finish when um, Pompeii was uh, covered in ashes, but because it only affected a tiny bit of the Roman world, the, the eruptions at Thera affected the entire Minoan civilization, absolutely everything. But they did get themselves back, but not in as big a way as earlier on. Um, he was also, like many archaeologists, he dabbled in politics. Um, and he's apparently um, responsible for the formation of Yugoslavia. Now that's really odd. Um, but Gertrude Bell, I think I got the <laughs> right one. I think it was Gertrude Bell. I probably got the wrong one. That's the right. Gertrude Bell 
created the borders in Iraq and Iran. And that everything's been because of her since, because of her boundaries, okay? Um, but when we look at um, Sir Arthur Evans, there's an exact parallel because wars have been fought over the boundaries and borders that um, the likes of Arthur Evans created as well. So naughty archaeologists, we should get involved in politics, Carl. Um, I think he excavated. I, I think he probably did. I think in the backdrop is he probably did, but I haven't actually got much for that. But I think he probably did. Um, so here we go. Uh, fields of interest: archaeology, museum management, journalism, statesmanship, philanthropy. Um, I don't come into that one. Um, and obviously, the main the main of his excavations was in fact in Crete, but it did actually start off here, um, and that's very important. He was very much influenced by the work of Heinrich Schliemann um, and he also influenced Gordon Childs, the archaeologist that we mentioned the other week. Now one thing I don't want to do is look a great deal um, at his sort of his background, you know, he, he was uh, born in 1851 at Nashville in England um, to John um, and Harriet um, Dickinson, um, who was the first child of John Evans, who in his own right um, had, had something, some involvement with archaeology anyway, um, and basically in publishing and antiquarian work. So, you know, Arthur Evans had um, some shoes to fill, in other words. There, there, was, there was some archaeology um, in his family. His, his, work, his, his involvement, his career, for example, um, across Yugoslavia. Um, he was there in 1875. Uh, he's very much involved in negotiations with uh, Turkish officials, um, Christians. He became a reporter for the Manchester Guardian and then keeper of the Ashmolean Museum um, in Oxford. Uh, Rent to the house there in January 1883. Um, he basically um, started to write articles on Roman roads and cities in Britain, um, but also very much in interested um, in writing up works on Roman remains in the Balkans as well. So that's the answer to your question. Um, and he very much started to become involved um, in interesting artefacts that were being sent to him by Heinrich Schliemann to the Ashmolean Museum. Um, because Heinrich Schliemann was, was, had been involved in the excavation of Mycenae, and obviously he was now, by the 1880s, 1883, when um, Arthur Evans was actually keeper of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. So some of the, he, he, was, he was in a perfect position because artefacts were coming to him. Mycenaean artefacts, obviously a little bit later, um, then the archaeological excavation that he would actually um, be involved in at uh, the site of Colossos. Um, but he, he was keeper of archaeology at the age of 34. Lots of, the, lots of these individuals are, are very young when they become keepers of archaeology. Um, excavations at Aylesford in Kent. Now this, we go back to... Right, we go back to Aylesford in Kent. The reason we've got this, this plan. Um, so there's Kent there. There's a territory of the Belgium, so you know what I'm talking about. So uh, this all links in, okay? And the, why, why it links in is as follows. Um, he was working at Aylesford in Kent on a cemetery of... A, a, it, it, I like these words, right? Excavation at Aylesford in, in Kent, a cemetery of the British Iron Age. Is there any mention of Celts there? Um, discovered in 1886. Um, and this was a site that he was excavating, he was responsible for. Um, and when he published his work in 1890, that's very important. He published his work. Um, and I'm not a criticism of the likes of Howard Carter, who didn't ever get to finish his publication. But he was very much into publishing work like Gordon Child. Gordon Child would, would be influenced by the fact you've got to publish your work. Um, and when he was um, excavating, um, he discovered a new type of pottery. 
known as the Aylesford Swirling Pottery. Okay, now the Aylesford Swirling Pottery uh, would be found across this entire region in the Iron Age. Why is it important? It's just a load of pottery. It was pre-Roman pottery, pre-AD 43, by about 100 years, and it was actually made on the wheel. We had pottery made on the wheel. That's why it's important in the South. You know, when I when I when I when I've been doing my lectures on the Romans, I always I always said, look, there was early Roman influences, that there was things like the wheel, and you know, and then people were dressing like Romans and all the rest of it. Um, and um, he discovered this type of pottery, and for the first time, uh, there was the re realization uh, that we had the wheel um, before the Romans got here. So the Romans didn't introduce the wheel. So that's the revolution in archaeology. We discovered that. Um, and the pottery itself, here, okay, um, is associated with the people here, but it's found over here. It's likely that the people who were uh, referred to as the Belgi, um, uh, we, we won't go into the naming and stuff, uh, may have had direct links with the Belgic people, Belgium. Belgic people from the continent. Okay, so it's likely that those people brought and introduced the wheel, and people across this area um, are making pottery on the wheel. That's why this is important. Um, and there's, and you can see there that lots of these types of pottery are really advanced. Um, if an archaeologist is finding anything like that on an archaeological site um, in, the, in Britain, they immediately think it's going to be Roman. Okay, because it's really advanced stuff. Uh, but it's not, it, it, it's earlier British produced pottery on the wheel. That, that's why this is very relevant. It's really difficult to throw those big pots. Uh, like like, like, like this, yes. Yeah. And you would have asked. Skill. <laughs> a, a skill, that's the word, yeah, skill. Yeah. You, can't, you can't just do these things willy nilly, you can't. Um, lots, lots of these things develop um, by building a, a, a skill base. <coughs> and I think, um, I, I've, been, I've been thinking really recently. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're living in the valleys now, and um, and, and basically opposite the house, right? There, there's there's a there's a hill, as there is all over the place, and it's covered in trees. And uh, you get an archaeologist saying, "Oh, you know, um, we first we we work, we would look from one hill to another, and we would see that that would be a perfect place to." build a house and all the rest of it. No, it wouldn't, because everything would be covered in trees. You wouldn't be able to see anything, okay? And the only way to actually understand the landscape is to put your mindset into the people who were there at the time, i.e. the mindset of people who are actually producing pottery in Aylesford. You've got to put your mind into the mindset of these people. That's the point, okay? And when you put your mind into the mindset, you realise that these people are highly skilled and they're, they're in certain areas uh, because they're highly skilled and able to deal with it, and that's how things change and occur. Um, so, um, and um, basically, um, this all sort of dates from about 75 years BC. Uh, now, one, one thing is, and this, this is quote from Sir, the archaeologist Sir Barry Cunliffe in 2012, he says that uh, Arthur Redden's analysis of the site at Aylesford is still regarded as an outstanding contribution to Iron Age studies, with a mastery and consideration also of the metalwork found at the site. Now just think of that. You know, whenever we look at archaeology, we always think that lots of the, those old fossils of archaeology and what they were saying um, is, is just no longer relevant. But you've got archaeologists saying, of an archaeologist um, publishing his work in 1890, 100 and nearly 30 years later, that what they were doing was relevant and still is relevant today. And that is very important. And then that leads you into Colossos. And is that really relevant? The reconstructions of what you're seeing today probably is. Um, so, Evans ended up um, going over Colossos. Uh, he did face severe health problems. Um, and he was um, he, he was married to um, uh, Margaret, um, who was also um, who also had <coughs> bouts of illness as well. Um, and it's this bout of illness that Margaret has, leading to her death, 
um, that meant that um, Arthur Evans uh, would start to wander aimlessly um, and to try and see meaning in his life. The, 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 the loss of his wife was catastrophic to him. Um, listen to this, right? <coughs> listen to this. this. This leads him to working at Knossos. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, on the 11th of March, 1893, after experiencing painful spasms for two hours, she died with Evans holding her hand of an unknown disease, perhaps tuberculosis, although the symptoms fit a heart attack um, at the age of 45. Now, you, you, met, this, um, you met this lady uh, in um, 1892, and he was with her for a year. So you can imagine, what, what that would do to his mind. Um, and, and he would then put his mind into archaeology. And we wrote this of, of Marguerite's and Mountain Keith and scented brooms of white, such as herself, she plucked a wreath, a wreath for her to write. For she was open as the air, pure as the blue of heaven, and truer love of pearl so rare to man was never given. So basically, and then um, waiting for the future. This, this will answer a lot of questions. This is about the Balkans now, and then it goes some weirdly, but it, it ends up in Crete, of all places. After Margaret's death, Evans wandered aimlessly around Liguria, ostensibly looking at Ter Termara culture sites and the Neolithic remains of Liguria caves. So we're looking at about 5,000 years ago. Then he visited the locations of his youthful expor explorations in the southwest, where he was responsible for the formation of the Italian. Uh, finally, he returned to live um, a hermit like existence in the cabin he had built for Margaret. Um, he must have been so devoted. This is just in the place of the here, you know. Um, the Ashmolean no longer interested him. He uh, complained, um, he, he complained. Um, in earnest, um, and he offered childish displays of um, rivalry um, with those that were involved um, at the Ashmolean Museum, whatever that means. After a year of grief, the man's intention in Crete began to attract his interest. Knossos was now known to be a major site, thanks to Evans' old friend and fellow journalist in Bosnia, William Stillman. Another old friend, Federico Palvo, the Italian archaeologist and the future excavator of Aestos, uh, was keeping him posted on developments at Knossos by mail. Archaeologists from the United States, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy were in attendance at the site watching the progress, so to speak, um, of the sick man of Europe, a metaphor of dying Ottoman Empire, with various um, pashas eager not to offend the native Cretan parliament were encouraged foreigners to apply for a permit to excavate, and then not granted any. The Crucians were afraid of the Ottomans removing any artifacts to Istanbul. The Ottoman method of storing was to require any would-be excavators to buy the site from its native owners first. The owners, in turn, uh, were coached uh, to charge so much money that none would think it worthwhile to apply in such uncertain circumstances. Even the wealthy Schliemann had given up on the price in 1890 and had gone home to die in that year. But in 1894, Evans became intrigued by the idea that the script engraved on the stones he had purchased before Margaret's death might be Cretan. <coughs> His grief abated steamed off to Heraklion and Crete um, to join the circle of watchers at these archaeological sites. During his year of tending to the details um, um, of administering the Ashmolean and writing some minor papers, so he was still managing the Ashmolean whilst he was in Crete, um, he had also discovered the script on some other uh, jewellery that came to the museum um, from Crete. Um, he announced that he had concluded um, to a Mycenaean hieroglyphic script um, of about 60 characters. Shortly he wrote to his friend and patron at the Ashmolean, um, 
and basically um, he wrote, he's very restless and must go to Crete. Arriving at Arachian, he did not join his friends immediately, but took the opportunity to examine the excavations at Knossos. Seeing the sign of a double axe almost immediately, he knew that he was at the home of the script that he'd seen um, in some of the script on some of the stones um, that he'd found, uh, he'd been given or whatever, uh, that there was a symbol of the double axe. He used the Cretan exploration fund devised on the model of the Palestinian exploration fund to acquire the site. The owners would not set, sell to individuals who could not afford it, but they would sell to a fund. Apparently, Evans did not bother to explain that he was the only contributor. <laughs> so there you go. So we might end up with a lot. <laughs> um, he bought a quarter of the site with first option to buy the rest later. Um, the firm was still in um, deficit. Politics um, in Crete were taking a violent turn, however. Anything might happen. Evans returned to London to wind up his affairs there and make sure the Ashmolean had suitable direction in the event of his further absence or death. <coughs> um, so this should go on, and um, there, there were, and it, there's a lot to be said here. Basically, September 1898, the last of the Turkish troops withdrew from Crete. The war was over, but not the fighting as the Christians took reprisals on the Muslims. History, eh? And the Muslims sought to defend themselves. Nothing's changed. The British Army forbade travel for any reason. Checkpoints uh, went up everywhere. Evans and the archaeologist Hogarth as well, and Myers returned to Crete together. Evans this time was correspondent for the Manchester Guardian, a role in which um, he um, reveled. His sharp tongue had not mellowed over the years. He was once again the pen viper. But this time, there was no administration to cage him. He was 50 years old. He could write whatever he liked and wrote whatever he liked about the Ottoman uh, Empire and its corruption, because he'd seen it first hand in Yugoslavia. Then he criticised the British Empire. Wow, for its collaboration with the Ottoman Empire. Many officials of the empire had been Greek. Now they were working with the British trying to build a credible Crucian government. So then Evans invented a new and elaborate term, the Turco-British regime. He criticised the Muslims for attacking the Christians and the Christians for attacking the Muslims. Um, he collided with the British military, complaining um, that the, uh, of the attitudes of the British higher authority. Evans went everywhere investigated everything recklessly. He was basically doing his archaeology on the back of life for the newspaper. Which is fine, isn't it? The newspaper's actually turned into view. Taking the side of the underdog, no matter who it was, he saw that the Muslim population was now on the decline, some being massacred, and some were planted in the island. After the massacre in the village of uh, after the massacre in the village of Ek, um, he came back mainly down uh, on the Muslim side. Um, so that's a bit, you know, so he's backing up the Muslims to wind up the Christians. And he's writing for a Christian newspaper. Can you imagine that? God, that's terrible. Uh, the villagers had been attacked <coughs> by Christians in the night. They sought refuge in the mosque. The next day, they were promised clemency if they would disarm themselves. Handing over their weapons, they were lined up to be marched elsewhere. They were told. Instead, they were shot. All of them. The only survivor being a small girl who had um, a cap thrown over uh, her to conceal her. So nothing's changed. And exactly the same happened in 1991 um, in Arthur Evans, Yugoslavia. Nothing's changed. After all, a hundred years later, it was still repeated. Prince George was complete. Um, well, here we go. Yeah, um, I think he's talking about Prince George of. Greece here, and a new con uh, constitution uh, with, the, with the Greek government. In 1899, the government of both Christians and Muslims were elected under it. Crete was a republic, although a protected one. Evans' political work was done. And that's, that's basically that. And now we're going to the archaeology. Let's get into that. that that's the background. That's the background. There's some nice, nice bits of uh, information here. But we won't do that yet. So let's look at some more images. Um, and... 
Now those those are the workmen, um, and they're, they're probably they're probably better equipped than the archaeologists themselves who would who would um, sort of um, dress in their in their posh outfits. Okay, but um, there you go. That's his workmen. There's one over there with a the shovel ready to dig. Um, there's some kind of mattock. Um, I don't know. Is that a hat? I don't know what that is. There's some kind of hammer-like thing, um, and um, and basically looking at his reconstructions now. Um, whether the reconstructions are right or wrong, how much is there, as Kathy asked. Obviously, Kathy, damn right obvious that that timber hadn't survived, and most of those hadn't survived, and most of that, but it's all about reconstruction. It's all about trying to get some gravity on the past. And to be honest with you, he was in the best place to see it, because he was ex that's the thing you see. When you're, when you're looking at the archaeology and how it is, and feeling it and touching it, it's probably the only archaeologist can give the impression of what the archaeology may have looked like because within moments that archaeology can decay and just deteriorate so it's all down to the likes of Arthur Evans to to allow the reconstruction of the past as I experienced at Santa Maria um, in 1997 when I was excavating there with this archaeologist McGraw and Angel um, because he was seeing the archaeology and thought that's how it should be uh, reconstructed and that's what he did there and then on the moment using some of the materials that were in the spoil and all the rest of it. Um, so there you go, we've already seen that, but if we, we'll, he's obviously copiously writing notes, plan there, uh, and lots of, lots, you can imagine that, the uh, reason where we're getting these thousand rooms from, as you can imagine, one, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. there's about, um, there's about 50 there, and you've got to repeat these across the site, and I'm actually probably starting to think more that the, we're referring to a thousand rooms in the archaeology, not the other thousand rooms above, or not the other 500 rooms above that, not the other 200 above that, and so on and so on. So virtually maybe thousands and thousands of rooms, obviously that's all gone. Timber being used, uh, mortar being used, terracotta being used, uh, well all the rest of it to actually build this, this wonderful um, erection to, past, uh, to a past society. And there he is. That's how he's excavating as well. Now, I, I, I do believe that the, the jar that he's holding is, is from a later um, period, Mycenaean period, uh, but there he is. Obviously, uh, we are going to be critical of Arthur Evans in a minute. <coughs> We're actually going to be critical of lots of um, archaeologists who've worked um, you know, with the island of Crete. Um, when, when it's likely that when he was excavating, um, um, they were interested only in what was below the Roman temples and what was below the Greek temples um, and therefore they were just being destroyed and just being pushed aside so we can get to the earlier stuff um, and that's the criticism. Um, today you'd probably not really got to this archaeology because there would be Roman remains on top of it um, which naturally if you're trying to get to the earlier remains you've got to destroy them and so therefore we'll stop at the Roman remains and leave the rest there. Um, that, that's the great dichotomy with lots of archaeological sites. When, archae when people say, was there anything there before? Well, if you're going to look what's there before, you've got to destroy the stuff above. And that, that's, that's the big problem. Um, but so that's the criticism out of the way. Um, we're looking at the Minoan civilization, and if you hadn't have taken that um, stab in the dark, we may not have the Minoan civilization today, we may not have the writing, we may not have this image of um, they're being civilized civilizations in the past, and all the rigs are um, is a civilization that started uh, 500 years BC. End of. Uh, there we go. There's that reconstruction that we've seen. Oh, look at that! It's not small, is it? It's quite big. Now, I've I've always got a theory about these, but I'm probably completely wrong. My, 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 my theory about these um, is that if, if, this, if this was a Neolithic jar, for example, I would say that it would be made in situ and just left there. Um, and, and maybe if you're going to produce something like this, the kilns must be really near, close by. Because imagine if, if, you're, um, if you've got this huge terracotta jar, right, you've got, and it's over there, You've got to move up these big steps and you've got to push it there and there and there and there. By the time you get there, it's going to be broken. So maybe 
that my idea is maybe that um, to produce these things, you have the kilns really nearby, and then you just push it over there, job done, easy. And you just leave it there forever until the archaeologist comes and breaks it. Um, but there you go, you could, you could basically jump in there, couldn't you? you you're talking about, um, he, he's a Greek. Um, he's either really small or really tall. Should we go with a really tall one? Okay, so six foot tall Greek, maybe. That would make that five foot in height. And that would make that about three and a half foot in width, diameter, maybe four. Maybe, maybe too much. Yeah, we wouldn't get out. You wouldn't get out, though, would it? Well, it would be a very long handled ladle. Yeah, that's true. No, you, you, you act, no, Kathy, don't even go there. I, I've tried to work that out myself. I'm not, I, not even gonna work that out. How, how do you get the stuff out of there? You know, it's, you, you can't exactly tip it, can you? Just tip it. Problem is, if you tip something like this, the thing's gonna break. It's gonna be because you, you, you push as you tip it, all the liquid is pushing up against this side, and it's gonna break. Pardon? Is it liquid or both? Well, I'm, I'm going to say both because this is a huge. Um, the site of Knossos was a huge um, storage area, and, and actually, uh, there's a point I completely <coughs> missed. Sorry, we're going to go back. But the point I completely missed was um, Minoan civilization. Um, um, Gordon Charles would have absolutely loved Minoan civilization. He probably did. Okay, it would be an ideal for Minoan civilization. Uh, God Child stood up for um, socialist values and he stood up for the fact that um, the, the past is more of a collective canvas rather than somebody rich, you know, just being about the rich people. You know, God Child said it was about everybody. You know? Minoan civilization was, was, was very much tender and gentle like that because um, it said that in Minoan civilization um, nobody wanted for anything. Minoan civilization provided everything. This is one of, okay, let's just chuck it out there, 10 palaces across Crete, okay, 10 um, within the Minoan world, okay, probably less than that, but we're going to go with 10 because we've got, we've got about five or six, um, Phaistos being one, and, you know, we've got probably 10, you know, um, and it's said that at one point, um, the numbers of people were living in and around this landscape, right, Call it a landscape. I don't know where they got this figure from. It was around 100,000 people. Quick mathematics, that would make the population of Crete 1 million people. Which is, which is no, 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 no. But um, with the evidence at this site, a thousand rooms on the ground floor level alone, lots of these, lots of these we find massive um, uh, pithos jars, okay? Massive pithos jars, huge pithos jars. Which, which each one of them would have been full, full of grain, uh, would have been full of liquid, uh, would have been full of dried out meat or whatever it is, all of these, right? The point is, you had never wanted for anything um, in Minoan civilization because all that was there ready for you to eat and drink. Uh, there's no sign of any poverty. There's sign that everybody worked and did their bit. Um, if you want to compare it with ancient Greek, uh, ancient Egypt, not Greece, but ancient Egypt at the same time, um, you're talking about um, the Keith is the pharaoh, um, you are a priest, Dennis, um, I would bring my food, put it on um, a little, what, the, what uh, ancient Egyptian civilization would, you would have had the great temple there, maybe at Thebes, and you would have had little stone tables, okay, on, a, on plinth tables, right? And what you'd do, you'd bring your, you'd put your stuff on the table, um, and you'd wave and think, oh my god, you bastard, and you'd walk off, because you'd, that, you'd never see that food again, that would go to you, and that would go to you, and that's <coughs> it. Like, Cretan society, it would go to me, you, and you. Okay, that, that's what's happening. Um, and, and, and that's what we see. And, and Cretan society probably collapsed because it was very much different from everybody else's. It didn't work, because... You, all, you need control, and you need to control the peasants, don't you? And the Minoans weren't doing it. But it worked. It actually functioned well. And this idea of sacrifice about... Um, the other thing as well is some people believe that um, this, the Minoan civilization is nothing about there's nothing really about sacrifice and the Theseus and uh, the King Minos and all the rest of it. it um, they believe that that's to do with another part of Greek 
thingy out there. Um, and um, and the idea of the labyrinth comes from Arthur Evans saying, you know, look at all these rooms, it must be the labyrinth of King Minos. So he was doing a similar from Wheeler. You know, we need people interested in this site, we need money, okay? The best way of doing it is saying, look, we found the, 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 the palace of King Minos. He was a lot more intelligent than that. He knew it wasn't true. He knew full well it wasn't true. After all, he was, he was getting people to decipher um, the, the, the pictographic texts. He was not a guy into fantasy. But like Sir Mortimer <laughs> Wheeler, where there's a legend, um, there's a fact <coughs> waiting to be told, and let's use it. And that's what he did. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, so what we're going to do now, uh, we're going we're gonna to take a break. Um, and um, if anyone wants me to get milk, I will, but if you want to look in the fridge first, uh, we'll take the collection and the do Dara for Birkins and Dara for any questions. No? Let's take a break. Um, and back to our wonderful um, Arthur Evans. I was just going to say Howard Carter. I know he's wonderful, <laughs> uh, but we're going to do Arthur Evans now. And what we're going to do, we're going to look through the images quickly, and then we're going to um, link them in with my text. So what, what what do we have here? We've got we've got freshly excavated archaeology. Uh, we've got scaffolding. We've got reconstruction. Kathy, there's your reel. Okay. And then we've got reconstruction, um, and we've got all this being supported, some steps there, um, some real reconstruction, and all the rest of it, so it's a composite cafe. Um, and all that there is being done alongside the archaeological excavation. 
because the archaeologist is there. And there he is there, in the white um, hat, pith helmet probably. Um, so there, there he is, always uh, in his guise, within the sense of uh, this wonderful civilization that uh, is the Minoan civilization. Um, as I say, hundreds of years before the Mycenaean civilization. And, and, and you can imagine that there is an archaeologist nightmare. Um, all these here are storage areas for, um, for your grain, um, for your, your dry um, fruit, like dates, for example. Pithos is full of um, wine, so that's one tier, okay, with all the other buildings as well. Um, and there would have been another tier above that. Um, and this is only this is only part of the labyrinth. And you can you can excuse Arthur Evans for saying <coughs> that this is a labyrinth of the Minotaur, um, where Theseus tracked it down um, to save um, Persephone um, from being ravished and so eaten. Yeah, there was Ariadne. Uh, that, that's my interpretation. But the fact of the matter is. Uh, this this whole complex was projected as being the labyrinth, and you can see why. There's, there's all these different mm -hmm. little rooms going off all over the place, and it would be multi-tiered and so mm -hmm. on. Um, but this would all this will all add to the myth and legend that is um, the temple of Knossos. You said they had so many can, can we just draw? Can we draw that back in? This is the key. We didn't have we didn't have a hundred thousand people living actually on that site. We had them spread over a large area. No, so this was the core, yeah. Because there were so many rooms. Yeah. So they lived with the oh yeah, they did. They did live with a group. <laughs> I, I I remember seeing a TV program about this, and, and the and it it, it was well, quite a nice TV program. And then that, then then I think the uh, presenter said, right, now we're going to talk about the complete annihilation and destruction of uh, Minoan civilization, where this wonderful way of life was completely swept away. It spoiled the program a bit. But he was describing that there was workshops. Um, if, we, if we go back a bit, he was describing that there was... Um, you can imagine that you've got, um, you've got this great plaza in the middle, and you've got, um, you've got workshops on the edges, sort of these types of areas. And then there's different levels, different accommodation. We don't really know how it worked, but everything was intermingled. Um, um, and, and the other thing as well is you can think, I know people who've been to Crete, and they say at certain times of year, Crete is the place, a type of place you do not want to go if you don't like the heat. Okay? Um, and all those different tiers would have been perfect, acted perfectly um, to, uh, for people to carry on. Uh, one thing, one thing um, that is a bit of a criticism of Greek and um, uh, Spanish culture, is that they haven't learned from their previous civilizations. Because when I worked in um, Spain, it was like, right, we all we start at 7 o'clock in the morning, we finish at 12, right, and then uh, we have like a five-hour siesta, and then we'll all work from like 5 o'clock to 8. Nobody ever did. Nobody ever went back to work, except the stupid archaeologists <laughs> like me, okay? Um, and... Um, because it gets so hot in places like Greece and Spain by 12 o'clock, you just cannot work outside. But these types of um, complexes were absolutely ideal for, our, for everybody to continue working. Um, and you, you, can, you can start at like 8 o'clock and you can keep going and you've got a nice little breeze and it's boiling hot outside, but you can keep working. And, and I think that that can be appreciated. And when light goes, you're not having to work at night when it's when it's freezing cold and, and, and it's dark. You're not having to uh, damage your eyes by using candles. And that's the time you sleep. That's, that's what you should do. Um, it's something that the Minoans learned about many years ago. And it, the, the Egyptians were the same as well. This, this idea of terracing. So in the archaeology, what we've got, we've got indications of big, hefty walls, bits of steps that have come, which have collapsed. And all Arthur, uh, all Arthur Evans is doing is he's just basically saying, right, if, you, if these are obviously steps, um, they're not going to be going like that. They're going to be going like that. So you simply reconstruct that. So you're halfway there, Kathy, right? And then you think, right, so you've got some of the basis of these pillars. So you think, right, you've got, um, you know, you've got a plinth, um, pillar base, and then, then you, then you uh, assess this to that height. 
So you're doing so well. That, that's a fairly good reconstruction. Uh, but then you've got to start imagining what the rest was like. Then that's the criticism, Cathy. But then again, is, is it, well, it's obvious, isn't it? You've got a flat roof. You're not going to have a, um, any other type of roof. So well, lots of these are, um, are obviousalities. That's a nice word. Um, I, I was corrected the other day. I was criticised for my lecture on Tuesday for one point. Okay. When, um, when Arthur Evans was working at the site, he employed the efforts of two Swiss artist architects um, who, were the, who were there to offer their own take on the frescoes. Okay. And I said, look, it's obviously a bit exaggerated, and you know, it's really colourful, uh, and it would never have been like this. Um, I made the slight mistake of, 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 of saying this, and Andy, who's one of my members in Cumbria, said, actually, Carl, um, you've got it wrong, you've got it completely wrong. The, the actual archaeological evidence of some of the great frescoes in, in the museum, Heraklion in itself, um, are actually far superior in artistic skill and, and, and projected coloration and the actual stuff actually on the site. It's good to be wrong in that way, isn't it? Mm. It really is. So it was more it was more garish than that. It was more um, there was more to it. And when you when you when you think about it in your mind you think, right, yeah that's great. Let's let's just do that. Um, and these um, obviously we've got pits of this surviving on the ground or whatever. And what 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 he's simply done, he said, right, this culture um, looks more towards, um, even though this, lots of these palaces are on the north coast, there's some on the south coast, lots of them look more towards the south, towards Egypt. When you look more towards the south, towards Egypt, this is where this architectural style comes from, where, where, you've got, where the pillars, instead of going like this, they go like this, okay? And this, this, is, like, um, this is another cultural um, projection of civilization, um, in the Middle East, like Iraq um, and Mesopotamian cultures. So I'm really defending this guy, aren't I? But I, I, I think I think I should, because I, I have been critical of some of our archaeologists. And actually, that that there, and it's a shame there's a bit of writing across it. Um, what we've got there, look at that. And actually, Kathy, I'm sorry to pick on Kathy most of this, but that was a question you asked. That is the archaeology. So it's not much of a leap of imagination. It's, it isn't much of a leap of imagination to take that, then and then then just put a bit of colour on it, and we know that colour because the frescoes have survived. So in fact, all we're doing, and then we've got then we've got a bit of roof there. No, that not not that because that's that's protected. It. Then we've got little bits of roof that have collapsed, and then we think, right, where do these go in order? And we think, right, they must have been here. They, obviously, they must have been on top. Um, and then that's all we're doing. So that's where the reconstruction comes in. And actually, the other thing, then somebody was critical and they said, oh, well, you must have made it all up. And then Andy also had gone to Akrotiri, which is the site um, at Santorini, Hera. Um, and he said, with the archaeological excavations at Akrotiri, um, that, that this, this is key. Akrotiri is excavated in the past few decades, years after Arthur Evans had excavated this site. When they excavated at Akrotiri, it was almost as if they were looking at Arthur Evans' reconstructions at, at Knossos. So in fact, he got it smack on. Bingo, there's, there's that. And, and, and the, the people at Santorini um, at Akrotiri were in fact Minoans from the same time. <laughs> and the Minoan civilization is known for collective similarities. Like Rome, when in Rome, Rome, Greece, whatever, that's the same thing. Job done. I'm not ramming this down your throats, but that's 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 a good direction to go. Be lovely to do Akrotiri as an archaeological site one day to um, to do a talk about it. But anyway, um, that that's more of the reconstruction. May not look good because you've got different tiers. Okay, you've got one tier, two tier, three tiers, um, just above there. But he, he's 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 doing what he can at the times, and he's doing a very good job of it. Maybe he was the lucky, but it's very difficult to get lucky with all this. Um, and there you go. Some some of the great pithos jars. Um, some of these would be placed into the ground. Obviously, um, how they're lowered out and whatever. So you you basically you need somebody to go into these things to take the stuff out, as Kathy says, or great big scoops and so on. And and, and I don't know if any of you have been in a situation where you've been hanging over something and you've nearly fallen in. 
Well, that's going to happen, isn't it? You can have a little child go, let me out! Um, let me out! Um, and, and this is what we're talking about. So all this is all, this is all part um, of, of the problems and things that we don't really understand. We don't really understand how they did. In fact, we, we can learn more about Arthur Evans' reconstruction and what we see at Akateri and what it, what, it, what it was like than how these things were actually used. I think that that's more important. We, we don't know how the whole thing worked. It's ba basically like being given the, um, the, um, the anti-Kythera uh, clock mechanism where, um, where we've got all the cogs and stuff, but to be honest with you, we don't really know how it worked. Oh, then again, we do and so on. We've got all this stuff, but we don't know how it works. It's basically being given a load of words, right? And their boat, ship, elephants, or whatever, put it all together and come up with a sentence. That's what, that's what, this is what a Knossos is like. We've got all this stuff there, we just don't really know how it went together. Um, and and they, there you go. Arc, um, there you go. Um, you've got original floor, original, um, original, original. Um, your column itself. Now, the problem is. <laughs> This is an interesting experiment. Oh, and there's, there's another thing as well. There's just so much to tell you, I can't do it today. But um, the pigment that they used in this, they had um, they, they, they had an expert in pigments um, and uh, chemical analysis back in the 1900s. He was able to work out from pigments and chemical analysis on some of the stuff that survived what pigments were used um, to actually paint these things with. So they used exactly the same stuff. To paint them with, but you can see from here that after after a hundred years they started to decay. But that would mean it was like that in the past. They would have had to have been repainted every few months or whatever, like yeah, not a few months, that's ridiculous. Every few years, like you're whitewashing the outside of a house. You always re or whitewash the outside of a house. So that's what we're talking about. And it's the same. Do you remember? Um, I know some of us uh, used to be smokers in the room. Uh, Keith. Um, Jokes don't work, do they? But anyway, if any of you were smokers, you can remember that you used to have to paint your house every few years because the walls would be yellow. And I bet you know people that used to do that. It's exactly the same thing. So all these, all these things we're learning and we're, we're, we're understanding. Uh, more of his plans. Um, and I want to do some of his notes before we finish. And just these little, little plans and stuff. I think this is all the same one. Um, and this itself... This itself is known as the throne room, right? People have argued with him that it can't be the throne room. Why would there be a throne in a palace? And but you've got a throne there. And he said this is a throne room, but archaeologists, some archaeologists says it can't be the throne room because um, that's a throne, but it's not a throne. And, and archaeologists have been some some archaeologists have been so pedantic about archaeology simply because they've been jealous. And there's the archaeology there. Nice bit of archaeology, really standing nice tall. There's a guy standing there. Is that Arthur Evans? I don't know. But anyway, look at that there. Right? And all they needed to do was put a lid on it. And they used the pigments from the wall. And they eventually they came up with that. What's wrong with that? The only thing they did, they, they put this, they, they had indications of beams. And, and, and they used the pigments, indications of the door. So the only thing that they've reconstructed is um, the only thing that they've reconstructed not knowing is the stuff in between uh, these beams, because the rest of it you got from the painting, the the, the pigments and plaster and stuff in the back of the museum and so on. Um, we know that where the doorway is, and we we got a throne, right? And he's just called it the throne room. But some archaeologists said you can't call it the throne room. But there's a throne in there. Yeah, but it's not a throne room. So you see where we're up against as archaeologists sometimes, even when you've got so much evidence, people are so critical. Um, and th there's more of it. You can see the throne behind. You can see the height. It's amazing archaeology, absolutely so well preserved. Um, and, and I don't think it's a leap of imagination uh, to think that it, may, it, that it was like that, you know? Um, and there um, is some of the original on the wall there as well. So it's not, you know, I, I, I should move away from this. I'm convinced it, I'm convinced it's really good. I'm convinced he, he, he practically got it smack on. Um, and so what we're looking at there, there's the, um, the, thro the throne room is indicated there. Okay, you can see that there, lots of these are quite high up levels. 
Um, and if we just, um, can we move that? Yeah, we go, the throne room. You can see that from the archaeological excavated evidence, uh, this is actually, there's actually lots of layers below this and, and all the rest of it. So there's lots of stuff intact to give you an idea of levels. And you can imagine that if you've got a thousand rooms on the lower course, and then you've got 800, and then you've got higher up, there's, there's lots of rooms in this, labyrinthial, all these processional steps. I'm using the word processional, which is wrong. Um, th th these people are just doing their lives. This is normal civilization. It's like, it's like what we've got today. We, we, we've got the shops and everything in Lansford Major, or we've got the um, um, David Lewis in, um, was it John Lewis in Cardiff, where we've got all that. It's the same thing. It's all interacting. It's all steps, shops, buildings, people working, people sleeping, people living, people doing this, people doing that. And it's exactly the same as in the past, except the difference is it's time travelled um, rather, um, rather than time per se and major changes, because this is still civilization. And there you go, these large jars, storage, uh, say that jar itself, um, I don't know how many gallons is in there, but you can imagine that that's, that's um, if you've got, if that's going to be full of grain, um, and that might be full of oil. And there they are in their excavation shoot, suits. There's Arthur Evans. One of those is the archaeologist Hogarth, and one of them is M M Myres. Um, and this is the this is some of the painted work, the spirals uh, that we can associate with Monoma civilization. Um, and proud they are too. Oh, and um, I didn't tell you, right? I didn't tell you. You see that? That's drainage. They had flushing toilets. Flushing toilets! Oh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I've got to finish soon, but I'm just, um, I, I really wanted to do more. There, 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 there you go, you've got, you've got that there. Um, I, I'm not really sure what we're looking at with, with real or contemporary. We've obviously got the floor. Um, that, that looks contemporary there. Um, I can't work out what's what there. That's obviously cast concrete in the ceiling. Struggling on this, but we've got a composite of everything there. Real, reconstructed, um, whatever. It's all there. And you can imagine that, that that's what these people are seeing in the past. Or something similar. The, the, the thing is that we're, what we're not seeing is the fact that there's going to be baskets there. Um, little wicker baskets. There's going to be food. There's going to be people, children playing. There's going to be people talking. There, there's going to be all sorts of things. That's what we're missing. And, and there, you, you've got the levels of archaeology. Uh, that, that's the archaeology, the different layers. And level upon level upon terrace upon terrace upon terrace. And actually, if you take, um, if you take away that, and, you, and if you take away, hang on, if you take away that, you've got the actual steps there, you've got the rooms, you've got buildings, um, and so on. Um, and there, there you're getting closer to the archaeology. And then the rest of that is what has been reconstructed. I wish you'd go away. Lily? Um, who's Lily? Right, okay. So there you go. There's more of it. More of these layers. And you can you can see, you can properly see the archaeology there. You can see the archaeology here before it's been reconstructed. More of the archaeology around here. More of the reconstruction. Really composite. Um, and visitors there. I'm back to my barracks. So what I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to give you um, a couple of minutes of max. And work out what this silliness is quickly. Oh my dearie me. Is Vodafone contacting me to tell me about the experience I had when I topped up my phone earlier on? I could not cope, right? With, with giving up 26 quid per month. Look what that did to me, kid. But quickly, just some quick facts. I'm sorry I'm going to have to rush this quickly. Um, uh, here we go. Starting in 1900, thousand interlocking rooms, intricate collection of rooms, workplaces, food, wine presses, artesian workshops. Um, it was a centre point. It was <coughs> a religious, administrative, living, um, pottery um, going from. Uh, there was obviously a palace afterwards going into the Myce um, Mycenaean period. So it ranged from about 2,000 years BC all the way through to approximately 1,300 years 
uh, BC, so it had a life of over 700 years, uh, longer than the British Empire existed. Um, different all the stratigraphic evidence, over 500 acres, uh, adventurer archaeologists, these clusters. Oh, this, the, the Knossos itself is a, is a set of small ruins, it's only over five, five acres, but it's massively significant. Here we go, uh, in the myth, the labyrinth had been built by King Minos to hide Minos, so half uh, man, half bull creature that was the offspring of Minos' his wife. Got that wrong, you are right, Cathy. Um, Persephone was um, King Minos' his wife, not, uh, not um, um, and uh, the offspring of Minos' his wife, Persephone, and a bull. So she had a relationship with a bull. Uh, Evans dubbed the civilization once inhabiting the great palace, uh, the Minoan civilization. Um, and it goes on to say, uh, here we go, most of the palace was excavated, bringing to light an advanced city containing artwork and many examples of writing. Painted on the walls of the palace were numerous scenes depicting bulls, leading Evans to conclude the Minoans did indeed worship the bull. In 1905, he visited, uh, he, he finished the excavations. He then proceeded to have the room called the throne room, due to the throne light stone chair fixed in the room, um, called the throne room, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And then, then for about another um, three decades, uh, they continued to um, they continued to conserve the site um, and to reconstruct it. But one little fact to end on, the site was originally discovered in 1878 by Minos Kalokarinos, Minos, M-I-N-O-S. Um, and the myth about King Minos, uh, the name is exactly the same. So whether in fact Arthur Evans named the site after um, uh, the, the civilization after the original discoverer, Minos Kalokarinos, or King Minos, is up for debate. But I think it'd be nice to think that Minus Kala Karinos, uh, his name is given to this civilization rather than King Minos himself. Well, I suppose it's the same as some of these old Arthur stones finding the palace, and then some of the old Arthur stones discovering the same Arthurian. I like it, that's nice. But no, in fact, it's actually so close, isn't it? Minos and Minos, it's the same word. Um, and just just a, just a few things. Um, excavations have continued there. A um, number of archaeologists have excavated there. The site, the first palace may have been constructed in 2000 years BC, but it's quite likely that there was an early settlement there going back to around 7,000 years BC. The site and the evidence that we have, ashlar blocks of lime, limestone and gypsum, um, wood, mud brick, uh, rubble, fill, plaster. The site is a composite of various architectural techniques available um, at the time. Um, and this, this, this interesting fact, this very interesting fact to finish with, 2000 years BC, when the palace was being built for the first time, maybe the population in that area was about 18,000, which is a hell of a lot of people. And I don't know where this fact comes from. And it, in its peak, the palace and the surrounding city boasted a population of 100,000 people shortly um, around the eruption of Thera in 1628 BC, and most of those people would have perished. The site itself um, is about 85 metres above sea level, but that would not stop a tsunami because it would just keep going up the hill until it, until it reached the top of the hill and over the other side as we saw with the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004. Um, are there any questions? No. No. Did, you all, did you all enjoy that today? Yeah. No, you didn't. Oh, that's a shame. Um, anyway, um, I really appreciated you all being here today. And um, next week, we're going to be looking at um, pottery kills.